A very, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have gathered here today for discussion on a book written by Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, We the People of the States of Bharat, The Making and Remaking of India's Internal Boundaries, which has been recently published and is much in news. I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Sanjeev Chopra and thank him for his uh, presence. I also welcome Professor Indivar Kamtekar, who is a senior fellow currently at NMML, and Dr. Sopan Das Gupta for very kindly consenting to formally chair this book discussion. So, a very warm welcome to all of you, and I also extend a very warm welcome to all those who have taken time out to be present for this book discussion. Dr. Sanjeev Chopra retired from the position of director, Lal Bahadur Shastri, National Academy of Administration. He had a distinguished career in the civil services as an IAS officer of the 1985 batch. But he has pursued academics also very passionately over the last few decades. He was awarded the prestigious Robert S. McNamara and Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowships in 1998 and 99, respectively. He has also been a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, Washington, DC. Professor Indivar Kamtekar is currently a senior fellow, as I earlier said, and he is a professor of modern history at the Center for Historical Studies of the Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has also taught at the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, the National University of Singapore, the University of Gottingen, the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and Heidelberg University. So then Dr. Sopan Das Gupta, who, as we all know, is an eminent Indian journalist, public intellectual, and politician, former member of Parliament Rajya Sabha, in 2015, Dr. Das Gupta was conferred with the Padma Vibhushan, and in 2016, he was nominated by the government for Rajya Sabha for his contributions to the fields of literature and education. He has worked in major national newspapers and magazines and has a doctorate in history from the University of Cambridge. His recent book, Sorry, from University of London. His recent book, Awakening Bharat Mata, The Political Beliefs of the Indian Right, was published in 2019 to a lot of public acclaim. So, and for us, what is especially important, that he has been a member of the Executive Council of this institution for the last many years and has played a very important role in shaping the academic life and also other things of this institution. So I extend a very warm welcome uh, to you, sir, and to all those others who are present. And uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Sanjeev Chopra to talk about his book briefly, say in 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi, and thank you for having us. I'm very grateful that it's being chaired by, by Swapan Das Gupta, a very eminent uh, academic, scholar, uh, politician, uh, and from Bengal, because that's where, my, that's where I served for a long period of time. And on my left, of course, is Indivar, my class fellow. He's, we've, I mean, we were together in JNU. He studied, but I did not study very much. But uh, I'm very grateful that he's here uh, with me today. Uh, and Ravi, of course, uh, has been helping me uh, up in coming to the Nehru Memorial, especially in the context of my research on Lal Bahadur Shastri, because I felt that, you know, having been the director of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, I, I really felt that there was a gap in scholarship on the, on the political biography of Shastriji. But that is where I became an endeavor 
connected me to Ravi, and after that, it's been it's been great. Okay, friends. So what I'll do is, you know, that uh, <clears throat> I'll first read to you the, <clears throat> the the sort of the final observation which I wrote after writing this book. And this book is the. I'll tell you the story about how this book came about. This book came about because in the in the training of the IAS officers, land settlement and land management is one of the most important aspects. And in fact, if there is one USP of the of the IAS, that is land management. And uh, you know, we used to be trained in land management through cadastral surveys and theodolite surveys, but a lot of technology has changed. And Survey of India is one of those great knowledge organizations in this country where they keep abreast of all the techniques of surveying land. And that's what the Survey of India was established for. It's, in fact, one of the first knowledge organizations of the country established way back in 1790. And 1796, we saw the first map. That time, it was called the Survey of Bengal. So I've taken these officers of the 2020 batch to the Survey of India uh, just to see what are the latest techniques of land mapping. And in fact, today, you have satellite, you know, and you have a 5 meter by 5 meter resolution. You've got drones, you've got Google Baba, you've got... So, and so mapping has become a very different concept from what it was in our times. But while this discussion was going on, I just moved into the next room of the Survey of India. I went to their, uh, to their exhibition center and I started looking at the maps of India from 1796 onward. And it's a veritable treasure house. Because every time the territory of the East India Company was added, I mean, in fact, they never... No territory was ever taken away from East India Company, but whenever any new territory was added, they would create a new map. So there was a map in 1796, there was a map in 1781, I mean, so 1770. So all this thing, you know, was a whole set of maps and maps and maps. And then I came to the section which looked at maps. I mean, they, they didn't say post-independence. I started looking at maps of India from 1947 onwards. And I was fascinated to note that the map of India also changes every two, three, four years. You know, the first map of India in 18, 1947, when you look at that map, it has no bearing to the map of India today. In fact, after the reorganization of Jammu Kashmir, there is not one area, not one territory, not one province, which is the same as it was in 1947. That is, Punjab is not the Punjab as it was in 47. Gujarat did not exist in 1947. Rajasthan was actually Rajputana, and then it became Matsya Pradesh, then it became Rajasthan. Maharashtra did not exist. The four southern states did not exist. Uh, the Secretary of MNDV and Minico Islands were under three jurisdictions. I mean, they were under the jurisdiction of Cochin, they were under the jurisdiction of Malabar, and a little part of it was being directly administered. So it was a, so it just struck me that, look, why don't I start looking at each map of India and then start looking at the transition which India, that is Bharat, has made from 1947 to 2019. And that was the time when Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh had just been made. So when I started looking at that, then again I realized that there are so many maps, so many maps, so many maps that one can't really, really look into all the maps. So then I started looking at, at how I started looking at the changes that you can spot from the map of 1947 to the map of 1950, to the map of 1952, to the map of 1953, to the map of 1956, to the map of 57, 58, 60, 61, 63, because all these are very important landmarks in the making of the country. We are all aware that, you know, uh, that we started with nine provinces, you know, because two went to Pakistan, uh, Sindh and Northwest Frontier Province, and Punjab and Bengal were divided, and we had 562 princely states. So the first three years, you know, the first, if you go through the map, through the books, the first map that I show is the map of 1947, where India is still nine provinces and 562 uh, princely states. Uh, I will not touch upon the way they were integrated because you're all aware that Patel and Menon did it, and they did it with great, with, I would say that, you know, it was the, very firm conviction of the political vision of Sadar Patel, and the and the very I would say I would use the word should and very intelligent uh, actions of Mr. Menon. I mean, he was able to forestall many things. He, for instance, uh, so when you would, uh, I mean, the Calcutta, the experts, they went to governor and said, "Why don't you make us a crown colony?" I mean, the 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 the, the Muslim League and the Congress are fighting 
So let them fight, but we also have the chance of being a crown colony. So this thing, so many other, you know, so there was a dispute about all capital cities. So all this became part of the, part of the work. Uh, when I started looking at the map of 50 and 52, the 52, the first map of India, and I'll tell you a little bit about all the maps of India, the interesting parts of all the maps. 1950, of course, uh, the Sadap Patel, the organized the maps, you begin to look at the map clearly. 52, the first map of India in Hindi was published. When that first map of Hindi was published in the north, it led to a riot in the south because the in the Madras Secretariat, they felt that this is a great imposition on them. But that is something which has continued in But I, what I was struck by the fact, and I talked to the Survey General of India, my became a good friend. You know, for the first time, the word Chin appeared on the map of India. Before that, the Britishers had never used the word China on the map of India. So how you look at the map uh, is also a reflection of how you look at your neighbors, you know, because uh, we would uh, we, we uh, would use the word POK, for example, you know, to reflect what, what our perception is. So we had no, I mean, the, the government of India, I mean, at least the British government never looked at China as a border territory. But 52, we started giving recognition to Chin on our maps. And interestingly, by 1956, Tibet disappeared from the map of India. You know, it was all sh being shown as China. So that's a very important geopolitical, uh, you know, assessment that we have to understand because your map must also not reflect what you think of yourself, but your map also tells you what you think of the, uh, your conception of the neighborhood. But anyway, that was 1952, you got Chin. 1953, Version one of Andhra state came into being, you know, after that, that, that big conflict on the movement. Of, I think I'm going to, I mean, I'll never be able to finish in 50 minutes. So, 56, you had the, we had the States Reorganization Commission. But before that, and something which, uh, uh, which many of us may not be aware, and I was not aware, I mean, I'd heard about it, that in 54, Bihar and Bengal wanted to merge and become one big state. Uh, but that was opposed at some point of time by the, by the UP Congress, you know, and also by the Communist Party of Bengal. Uh, but that apart, you know, so 56, this happened, 60, uh, you know, and 56, the SRC had come to the conclusion that there should be no small states, especially no small border states. Because they felt that, you know, because the international uh, boundaries have to be, the first line of defense, international boundaries has to be Punjab police, Bombay police, Assam police, so they were opposed to the making of small states on the border areas. And therefore, even though Punjab, Assam, and Bombay, they wanted a reorganization, this was not accepted. But 60, Maharashtra and Gujarat happened, uh, and then, uh, you know, these two states happened. More interestingly, Nagaland happened in 1963. It's so important in the context of the clashes that we are seeing today uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Manipur, because, uh, you know, the, the ethnic, I mean, not uh, giving uh, space uh, to ethnicity, giving space to an ethnic community or a linguistic community to get a political formation. And that's where I bring a larger proposition. That is that it's time that we started looking at the sixth schedule in a more creative manner. Because while more and more states cannot be made, we can certainly rework the, if not the fifth schedule, certainly the sixth schedule, because that's the only way, uh, I mean, the Lepchas and the Cookies and the Zoos and, and the many multiple communities can find space and recognition. So to cut a long story short, friends, uh, 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 this is an important milestone. Then 75, uh, Sikkim is a very important milestone for us because we had to amend the constitution twice uh, because uh, by Article 1, Schedule 1, not, a, not an inch of territory can be given away, but not an inch of territory can be added. That brings me to Teen Bigha. Now, before the land border agreement, which was signed uh, between uh, Muji, uh, between um, <coughs> Mr. Modi and uh, the and, and Sheikh Hasina, we had to you know transfer Teen Big, and I was the ADM of Kuch Bihar. It might interest you to know that you know there was a lot of opposition from Kamal Guha. He was totally opposed to this. So at that point of time, when we could not we could not hand over Teen Bigha, we leased Teen Bigha to Bangladesh, a 999-year lease for rupee one per year, which the President of India then decided to waive because we could not alienate land to Bangladesh, but nowhere in our constitution uh, do we say that we cannot, you know, we cannot give land on lease. So 75 was Sikkim. Again, Sikkim became a part of India, very important because demographics had changed. Uh, by 1947, the Nepalis were in a majority in Sikkim. 
And therefore, you know, it was not a smash and grab operation, which is what Sunanda K. Dutta Ray, at that time, one of the, one of the more well-known journalists of the country wrote. Uh, and again, it shows that, you know, when whoever writes history gets a perspective on it. I mean, there are four books on Sikkim. Uh, one has been written by, by Smash and Grab by him. The other one was written by B.S. Das, who was the administrator. So he's given his own viewpoint. Uh, uh, then there was uh, the, the nephew, uh, Andrew Duff. He wrote a book that was from the sp perspective of the Scottish missionaries. Then two books have been written, one by a raw uh, person and one by a foreign service person. So all of them look at, look at reality. So the same reality, the same picture, is shown in many different ways. Anyway, again, to cut a long story short, because um, uh, there's a lot to be discussed and said. So f there used to be a lot of, you know, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the national parties, especially the, the BJP also and the Janasangha, were not very keen on having smaller states. But by 2000, uh, consensus had evolved when the Northeast had been, you know, reorganized on ethnic and linguistic lines, that it is okay to have smaller states. By 2000, there was a major consensus on how uh, on how these uh, smaller states can be made, and that's how Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and this one was created. Then, of course, you have Telangana, and now you've seen how the how this new reorganization has taken place. So, this is actually a, uh, an empirical study to whatever records I could get, but some interesting insights. One. Uh, that contrary to what we, what, 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 I mean, I wouldn't say contrary to, but a lot of people do not uh, really uh, realize that uh, Mr. Jinnah hated three people in this country, other than hating Nehru and uh, Gandhi and all these people. And these were three uh, Muslim leaders in this country. He was, he, he resented Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah like mad, because Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah was a great speaker, a great orator, and could sway audiences, and he had studied in Aligarh, uh, you know, uh, he didn't like the Nizam of Hyderabad. Um, the Nizam of Hyderabad had a very interesting relationship. He wanted to poke his nose into Pakistan. He, he was already a pan-India Islamic leader, but he wanted to be a pan-Islamic global leader. That's how the Nizam was wanting to position himself, and that's something which Jinnah did not want. And third, of course, was the was Soradi, the Chief Minister of Bengal. They didn't get along at all, uh, but that's another matter. So, so these are some myths, you know, that we have uh, in our mind. So as we go along, I think that the beauty of our country, the, the strength of our country has been that we've been able to, uh, to reorganize ourselves, that the states of India, the states of India have been able to uh, have, uh, I mean, the political parties in this country have also responded to this. Uh, so I'll just read the, uh, read the last, uh, I'll read the observations because not everyone will read the book. Even if everyone read the book, no one will. No, not everyone will buy the book. If you buy the book, you may not read it. If you read it, you may still miss out some of the uh, some of the most interesting parts. So I read out the uh, read out what I think is the is the is the most interesting observation in the book. Uh, <clears throat> First and foremost is the fact that the notion of identity is fluid. You know. You are a Punjabi, you are an Indian, you are an Uttarakhandi, you have multiple identities, you know, so that the sense of identity is fluid. Uh, second, language is usually a force which brings people together, but the script can be very divisive. I mean, we have a, I mean, Punjabi is one example, Sindhi is yet another example of the script in which the Sindhi has to be written. We've had a major conflict in Manipur on the script. Uh, uh, then the third is that, uh, <clears throat> There's a considerable difference in the way pan-India parties and regional parties look at issues. And this has always been there. Third, political parties change their perspectives with time and under on-ground-level realities. Fourth, migration affects demography, which has a direct bearing on electoral politics. Fifth, there's a gap between the national, what the national political leadership of a party may want and what the ground-level workers will actually do. You know, uh, and that becomes very clear in the in, in the in the in Bombay and in the in the reorganization of Bombay into Gujarat. And I mean, neither the Congress nor the Bharati Jansang nor the Communists. I mean, none of these parties wanted the reorganization of Bombay. But the ground level force was such that people left their political affiliations. I mean, their ideological affiliation. So when it comes to a conflict between an ideological dispensation or an ideological disposition and what the linguistic ferment would be at that point of time, uh, that would happen. Then the uh, English language press, 
the Hindi press and the regional papers have very different points of view on most issues. The opposition to an idea can come from the most unexpected source. I mean, the opposition to, uh, to what I might call sensible, or you might call not sensible, that can come from, any, from anything. And uh, every story has multiple perspectives, as came out in the case of Sikkim. And ninth, that while seven decades is a long time in the history of an individual, for a nation, history spans centuries. And from a civilizational perspective, we have to look at millennia. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for introducing the book to the audience. Uh, I would now like to request Professor Kamtekar to make his comments. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to um, be able to discuss this book by my uh, old classmate, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, who, contrary to what he says, has studied a lot through his life. There's no doubt about it. There is, I would say, this, and I would also say that uh, though he may make light of it, some of the JNU stamp of curiosity and so on, I think he will not be able to deny uh, comes through. So we, you know, our institution would appropriate him, even if he doesn't want to be appropriated. So let me say straight out that this is a very fine book, and before I start criticizing and quibbling and questioning which I'll, obviously I'll do, let me say why it's such a fine book. And the short answer is because it is very informative. Before reading this book, I had no idea that the Congress leadership of UP wanted the state to be called Aryavarta. In fact, he points out that there are 20 names which were discussed, Avad, Hindustan, Bhagirat Pradesh, Brahmadesh, Ramakrishna Prant, Himalaya Pradesh, and ultimately, the settlement was on Aryavarta. And it, this was wanted by Sampurnanand, by Govind Ballabhant, by Purushottam Das Tandon. And the reason it didn't happen was because of the Congress high command. Now, I had no idea about this. I don't know how many of you would know it. But the reason I'm saying this, and it was uh, overruled because presumably other people felt such a title should belong to them as well. Now, I had no idea about this. I don't know how many of you uh, knew this. But this book um, <coughs> abounds in such nuggets of interesting information. He mentioned about the Teen Bega Corridor leased by Government of India in 1992 to Bangladesh for 999 years. He also mentions that Ladakh in the late 1940s wanted to be linked to Lahore and not to Kashmir. Uh, that Ambedkar wanted Bombay to be a separately administered city, that he, would so, he saw it as a kind of safer haven for scheduled castes, that he felt it should be not really linked to Maharashtra, that Karunanidhi wanted the capital of his state to be Madurai, and so on. So by reading it, there is this richness. And I must say that in our subject, we are used to people taking political lines, but information is something which we crave. So lines we all know, but he has the great merit of actually telling us many things which we don't know. The title of the book, We the Making of um, the People of the States of Bharat is intriguing. It begins with a parade of, I must say, well-deserved blurbs. It's 250 pages divided into 18 chapters. It's very well written. Uh, there are some maps though I wish they could be of better quality, but that's an expensive business, I, get, I guess. So uh, maybe on the internet or something, there can be a supplement. And it is written by, well, as you know, as you can see, by Sanjeev runs a literary festival. He's directed the Masuri Academy by an enormously energetic and multifaceted individual. Now, Sanjeev, let me flatter you a little more before getting down to criticism. Before getting to JNU. Yes, exactly, before, before getting. getting... So <laughs> let, me, you know, let me go over the top. One of the rulers of colonial India was Sir John Strachey, 1823 to 1907. He spent a life in Indian administration, chief commissioner of Awadh, lieutenant governor of NWFP, finance mem member of the Governor General's Council. He wrote books like, Finances and Public Works of India, 
Later, he wrote a book called India, which went into multiple editions. So I'm saying, Sanjeev, you join a line of scholar administrators. If you write a fuller book, then we will have histories of India from Strachey to Chopra. Uh, or I would hope, I would hope, uh, Sir John Strachey to maybe some Padma title before Chopra. Now, the focus of this book, uh, the focus of attention, he rightly points out, has been on external boundaries. And he brings the focus to internal boundaries. And as he said just now, the internal geography of India has changed completely from nine provinces, 562 states, and so on. By bringing together this story, which hasn't been told between the covers of a book, as far as I know, he's performed a task which is not just convenient, but necessary. It's a large subject, and he's brought it together. So if you gallop through it, then 47 to 50 integration of princely states, 50 states reorganization, 1953 Andhra state with Karnul as capital, 1957 Kerala, 1960 Bombay divided, 1963 Nagaland, 1966 Punjab divided, then Tripura, 75 as he said, Sikkim, 87 Arunachal Pradesh and others, 2000 Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, 2014 uh, Telangana, 2019 Ladakh has union territory, we know what happened in Kashmir. So the date of births of states, how the states got their borders and names, basically Nam, Babka Nam, that kind of stuff is all there. Um, he also goes into the motivations, why these states came about, aspirations, assertions, adjustments, AAA, aspirations, assertions, adjustments. Even more interestingly, he talks about things which did not happen. And this, I must say, expands our imagination. We need, and we don't have this in our history, we need to know about ideas which have failed. And historians tend not to do this, but they should do it. Let me just digress a little. We have all seen, and I've had the misfortune to mark scripts, uh, where there is this question, was partition of India inevitable? Now, the idea that you know, such a question would be common in exam scripts would have completely mystified people in the early 40s. Uh, would India be partitioned at all? This is a question which was in people's minds. Nobody expected the bloodbath, maybe one or two did, in Punjab, the transfer of populations. Even Sardar Patel said Pakistan will not survive, will want reunification with India. And I sometimes wonder, is this a problem with our profession, that our job seems to be to make something which is in unexpected look as if it is inevitable. Nobody knows what the future is going to be. Afterwards, people try in our jobs to show that they are inevitable. Anyway, let's get down to some of the specifics. Dr. Chopra Sanjeev deals very well with the instrument of accession and the merger agreements, and he distinguishes between the two. Uh, instrument of accession is about defense, external affairs, and communications being given by the princes to the center. Uh, integration, uh, merger basically means extinction of considerable power. But, and here I think he follows the standard line that the integration of states is somehow projected as a diplomatic victory, the skill of, which was no doubt there, of Sardar Patel and B.P. Menon. And it is a huge achievement. But there is a problem if this is made to look purely like a story of persuasion and persuasive skill. And the proof of that is what happened in Hyderabad. So the Nizam overestimates his strength. He becomes too big for his royal boots. He makes a loan to Pakistan. He orders arms from Canada. And then the Indian army is sent in to finish him off. It, this, it is called Operation Polo. It's called uh, police action. So basically, a military operation is called a police action. Uh, fast forward, even in. Uh, the Northeast, in a place like the state capital of Mizoram, in Azol, it has been machine gunned from the air by the Indian uh, armed forces. And if you go to the state museum in Azol, they will have a poll saying, which, which is riddled with bullets, basically saying, this is what government of India has done to us. Um, then, of course, we know about Goa. So, of course, there was great persuasive skill, but let us not ignore the fact that there was always the threat of the stick. And that has to be also taken into account. 
Another point, the Roy Sinha proposals, and this is more a reflection, that it is amazing that B.C. Roy and Sri Krishna Sinha, both CMs, wanted a merger of Bengal and Bihar. And Dr. Chopra guesses that this is because B.C. Roy felt that the area of Bihar would make it easier for the Bengali refugees from East Pakistan to resettle. Now, I would put it to you that there is something else also which might be at play. And that comes out of Joya Chatterjee's second book, where one of the arguments is that essentially the Bengali elite miscalculated. They didn't realize that if the province is partitioned, and of course it was a conditional acceptance, they wanted the partition of Bengal, but if India was to be divided, but they didn't realize that the weight, once the numbers fall, your strength in a democratic polity decreases. So it is possible that they might have wanted uh, greater numbers if they could control that joint operation of Bengal Bihar. So it might be a possibility there. I don't really know, but I'd put it for his suggestion. <laughs> the other thing about a place, you know, he talks about the integration of the French settlements. This again, you know, and it is something, history is so strange and so exciting when you look back on it and so unbelievable that when there was a referendum in Chandan Nagar, 97 or 98 percent of the people said they wanted to join India. And of course, Pondicherry was also taken in and the other territories. Now we ask ourselves, we can. Would this happen today? In Pondicherry, there are 15,000 people, maybe the Franco Tamils. The slogan is French by identity, Tam French by nationality, in Tamil by identity. All these votes date to a time when migration was not such a problem. But if you had votes now, what would happen if people had the idea that they can earn in euros and spend in rupees? So we really go back to another time that that commitment to being part of India was partly because they did not foresee the future. None of us can. Let me come now with these reflections to a few points of critique. Now, these are minor and for the second edition of your book. Um, you know, page 31, drug is actually, you mean Durg. Page 55, 98, the name of the Tibetologist is Claude R.P., not Apri. Uh, 286 page, Rajaji was not governor general of Bengal, he was governor general of India, which you recognize. So I'm basically showing that I've read your book carefully. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> this is the point. Uh, now, uh, when, uh, one other reflection, that when we study administrative reorganizations before independence, we, what is the big story is the partition of Bengal or rather the protest against the partition of Bengal. Uh, it's not the creation of the separation of Burma or the creation of Bihar. So we have different forms of knowledge. When we are looking at British rule, we are looking at protest. When we are looking at Indian rule, we are looking at administration much more. Uh, and of course, in colonial times, they would look at administration much more and at protest less. The other point, which in, if the discussion gets going, I may, um, I may also speak a little more about, is the use of we, which you speak about, which you use quite often in the book. We did this, we did that. And my question is, who is we? What did the people of India actually expect from independence? You know, this is a question which is not really asked in our history writing. In fact, if one goes into it, because actually this is a fairly difficult question, very interesting question. Uh, there is, we have one account of an ICS officer who rode on horseback through the northwest provinces, uh, UP, Punjab, central provinces, to ask on the eve of independence, what is the peasant thinking? And he goes, he gets off his horse, so it's very much an elite subaltern study. And he says, what do you expect to get out of independence? And the answers are amazing, that there are soldiers back from the fronts in Punjab, and they, one person says, in free countries, everyone travels in cars. We will travel in cars. Uh, in UP, some peasants say to him that we will have guns to defend ourselves against the coits. In one place where there is a Congress worker, people say, the villagers say, we will get technical education. Uh, another vision of independence is that we will eat more fruit and vegetables. Somebody else says we will have more clothes to wear. Um, 
in one area, they say there will be no restriction on grazing cattle. Forest laws will go. Uh, so there are many. The short point is that what we do not see is that the independence underlying argument of Indi Indian independence and the national movement was what we now know as an Ache Din argument. And one of the issues of independent India was how then do you reconcile that with 1.5% per capita growth per annum? So these are questions. So when you're talking about, now back to your book exactly, that we have to be careful about this. When you say we, are we talking about the people of India or are we talking about the administrators of India? This is the question which I would put to you. And linking to this, that this book is a celebratory book. That's not a bad thing. But it is self-congratulatory. And on what basis is one self-congratulatory? You are self-congratulatory if your criterion is the survival of India. Now, Westerners said, India will not work. It will fall apart from Churchill onwards. Selig Harrison wrote uh, India the most dangerous decades. Now, I would say as a matter of national pride, why do we have to respond to that now? You know, at 75, do you say somebody, congratulations for making it? Or you, as you say, that in Pakistan, 1956, they had that one scheme, and look what happened to them. But must we compare ourselves with Pakistan? Uh, should we then think in terms of other than survival? And maybe pose questions with more self-confidence. Can we look at the issue of thriving and ask, therefore, this is I'm putting to you, could we not have had better administrative arrangements? Was there any price to be paid for doing things the way in which you have described in this book? And as an administrator, you would know because you have faced uh, situations on the ground. So I'm putting to you this question. What are the drawbacks of such boundaries uh, to these arrangements? Should the criteria by which we analyze India after in the last 75 years, should it be the survival of India or should it be the thriving and development of our people? Would you like to reflect on this? Good books like yours lead to further questions. And I'll round off with one of them. The question is, what does the redrawing of boundaries mean for people on the ground? Now, if something becomes an international border, let's say between India and Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, then new activities arise. Smuggling arises. Army presence is there. Things change. What does the creation of a new internal border mean to the people who live in the units? And I would put to you, when we reimagine our future, that that is something we really know, need to know about. If we have a state of Kur, or Bodoland, or Saurashtra, or whatever, what is that actually going to lead to? So I'm putting to you this thing, that your book is about the causes of boundary creation. But as an additional, maybe for another book, what are the results, impacts of boundary creation? In other words, can we move from administrative history to people's history? How would you, in your next, or next, next book, move from causes to consequences? Finally, just amusing, uh, something to think about. The bedrock of such analysis is that national boundaries are non-negotiable. Internal boundaries are highly negotiable. Now, and at the Bharat Mata temple in Banaras, the object of worship is a very large map of India. When you speak of Bharat Mata, when a nation is spoken of as a mother, as India is, it becomes hard to imagine that its territory might have any other political shape. It is difficult to imagine that your mother may have different features. But a nation state is not a person. And if the countries of the world had the ability to reimagine and negotiate their national borders as well as they negotiate internal borders, how much better a place the world would be. That said, thank you for this excellent, thought-provoking book. Thank, thank you very much. May I now invite Dr. Sopandas Gupta for his comments. Sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjeev, for writing this delightfully uh, informative book. And thank you, 
endeavor for a highly provocative uh, intervention, which sometimes I'm in, in tempted to in, uh, re respond to endeavor, but I'll resist that <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> Make my job easier. <laughs> you know, the other day I was just, uh, when I received Sanjeev's uh, book a couple of days ago, I've just had two days to glance through it and read it. I was just reflecting on a time, uh, perhaps sometime in the early 80s, when I shifted a large section of my collection from all parts of the world to Delhi. And the section on Indian politics, that is with, uh, contemporary, that is post-1947 Indian politics and affairs, uh, actually didn't take up more than a shelf. I'm talking only about English language books, and I'm not including government reports in that category. I'm just reflecting on just scholarly books. So it was a very thin collection, mainly written by British or American academics, with very few Indian names in that. And if you look at it now, it's a sea change. The number of books is just multiplying. The number of studies done by Indians in India has increased manifold. This includes which are quasi-journalistic works as well. Now, Sanjeev belongs to, to that very glorious tradition, as Indivar has pointed out, of scholar bureaucrats. And those scholar bureaucrats, I don't want to decry them at all. I think they had a wonderful contribution in adding to our knowledge of India. Sometimes they may have got it wrong, as in the things about the interpretation of the Gentoo laws in the 1780s, uh, which, you, which you might be familiar with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but still fairly recently, most of us read our histories from Vincent Smith, who was uh, ICS official. They looked at Philip Mason. They looked at Penderil Moon. These are people who contributed quite a lot in documenting India. And they were very good at documenting. Now, it's a shame that that tradition hasn't expanded. And I think I'm glad, Sanjeev, you're one of those who's actually kept up that tradition and bringing this book up. The important thing about this book is that why a book like this hasn't been written earlier. I think that strikes most of us. Especially if you look, look at, we've seen, when we talk about the integration of the princely states, we are still dependent on Menon. We've got a fair amount of studies on the princely states prior to 1947, a fair amount of studies. But post-1947, how that integration, how that entire process, right from there, say for instance, having two big states, like the, what is now Gujarat and what is now Rajasthan, the Saurashtra bit, the Rajputana bit, two immediate case studies if we are not to in include uh, Hyderabad or Travancore or the bigger places. But very few studies of that that exist. The details of that integration, the adjustments, the, the details of those negotiations, and each of those negotiations are quite fascinating because they are bound with the individual idiosyncrasies of those rulers. And some of them were bribed with rather measly sums. There might have been princely sums at that time, and with titles which meant very little, etc. So there's that part. Secondly, Sanjeev's book is written primarily as an account of political wow. geography. So I think Indivar, you're a bit unfair to, uh, to ask him to write about things which he's not addressing. Next book. Uh, next book. <laughs> or the book you should have written. <laughs> 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 So it's, it's really ab about political geography. And within the confines of political geography, what comes across is, is quite fascinating. Firstly, I think we have a temptation in India to deify the sayings of what we consider the great people. And what comes across in this is how inconsistent most of the greats of India post-independent, were in their attitude towards the internal reorganization of India. Jawaharlal Nehru, it is clear, was thoroughly, passionately opposed to the idea of linguistic states. 
I mean, he, he, I mean, much of the political turbulence which happened in that period owes its origins to Nehru's intransigence on this part. Had he been a little more uh, accommodative, much of that could have been probably done smoothly. But you know, we we that's counterfactual history. We can't talk about it. Uh, we we can't talk about what would have happened. The point is, his opposition, whether to Andhra the formation of Andhra Pradesh, whether the, you know, the separation of Maharashtra and Gujarat. These were classic examples of that. And the other point is how even others, like Raja, Raja Gopalachari, wildly inconsistent in all whatever this, the political parties, they were also wildly inconsistent. Smaller states, bigger states, multilingual states, there was no consistency in anything. So there's to say about that, you know, Britain created an empire in a fit of absent-mindedness. I think in a many sort of ways, there's no single pattern in how the internal reorganization of India was effected. We just blundered through. And we blundered rightly, in my view. By and large, it's not been now we've got a pattern where more or less it's there. Secondly, uh, an, an, another point which is to be noticed is that the States Reorganization Committee, set up in the mid-50s, gave prescriptions which were, by, in, in, a, in, 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 in a very large number of cases, outrightly rejected as being impractical on the ground or impossible to administer. So this linguist, this report, the basis on which we formed the entire linguistic states basis, was flawed in many respects as far as, India, as far as the internal reorganization was concerned. So these are important points to take into account when this sort of thing was happening. Now, the other point is there were lots of loose ends in the reorganization of states. The loose ends meant, firstly, that was economic considerations, backwardness or forwardness, going to be a criterion. It came to the, to the fore in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana. It came to the fore in Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh. There are still outstanding issues like that in Maharashtra, Vidarbha, etc., which are still playing. The question of ethnicity language hasn't been fully resolved as yet. There's the Gorkha land issue, which is outstanding in Bengal. It's a completely different language altogether from Bengal, but there are political calculations which also have to be done. So the, the reorganization of states is by no means an accomplished process in India. It's still an ongoing one, and it's going to be it's going to continue for some time and do different criterion are going to be adopted. The allergy towards smaller states, which existed in the 50s, partly because there was an allergy towards anything which was small. I mean, Nehru liked things which were big. And there was, there was a sort of uh, conventional wisdom at that time that the larger the state, the more economically viable it will be. Although why, with the centralized planning commission, that viability to add that upper hand is not something I'm uh, uh, entirely clear about. But now, with economic decision making to a very large extent decentralized, whether we are going to see variations of what the British actually wanted for Calcutta in 1947, that is the crown colony, and which they, they wanted a similar version of that for Bombay, in the, during the time of the separation of Bombay, uh, Maharashtra, and Gujarat, is a moot point as to think. Will there be demands now for a separate state of Mumbai? Will there be a demand for a separate state of somewhere else which uh, is economically successful? These are questions which are outstanding. And I think the pattern, uh, if we reflect on the, the larger themes of this book, you'll find that it would suggest that this is by no means a complete process. 
And I think the political understanding on the subject is going to evolve more and more. And so there is no finality as far as what people's views on this are concerned. Now, there are large numbers of questions which are there on uh, you know, the, the richness of detail in this. Uh, 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 Indiva has rightly pointed out the, the, uh, the curious case of Uttar Pradesh, a state whose name was never, the, the name Uttar Pradesh was not on the consideration of anybody in Uttar Pradesh, <laughs> ironically. So once again, here, like, what we consider our national dress was not on the what's not debated ever. It was someone's own sartorial taste which became the national dress. Similarly, one person's individual taste became Uttar Pradesh. You might as well have gone with United Provinces. Uh, it wouldn't have made a real <laughs> fundamental difference. The other thing which comes across is that how certain people were completely intransigent in certain ways. Muradji Dehi Desai comes across as one man who I think, I think was inflexible to the nth degree. And in, in terms of not being willing to listen to, not having any desire to listen to this. If Raja Gopalachari showed a lot of political naive, Muradji Desai was a case of complete inflexibility. And I think these, these, these are important facets, each of which could do with subsequent research, elaboration, etc. I think what's interesting about it is that the number of research topics you can actually get from this book to actually study in, in the future. The question of the merger of Bengal and uh, Bihar, which uh, Sri Krishna Sinha and Dr. B.C. Roy mooted for some time, was not because the Bengali Bhadralok necessarily felt too beleaguered. I think it was a simple question of rehabilitation. I mean, I mean what, what was very revealing about uh, uh, Indivar's comment, and Indivar is a his historian of the partition, and he said the violence in Punjab, I wonder there was an another part of the country which also got a lot of violence, you know, and had a large de degree of migration of population. Now, that point is sometimes missed out in this view that what was there was this shortage of land, of people actually coming across an entire, it was not an entire ethnic expulsion, but it was a semi, it was in drips and drabs which took, took place. And the need for land, and the, rather than settle them in the Andaman Islands, and in the midst of Madhya Pradesh, or in some remote part of Orissa, there was a thing of whether, you know, this was the, this was the, noble idea behind this, but a noble idea that does not necessarily work in practice. And it was thoroughly and fiercely unpopular and had to be ab abandoned very soon. So we come across, therefore, various of these quirks, quirky things in the, uh, in the in entire process, which actually tells you the story of the entire politics of India after independence. The reorganization of states is actually the story of the entire political thing. In every respect, you will come across it. And that's why it's so fascinating. And it tells us many more. Now, maybe there will be many more questions in the discussions which follow. I'm just curious in one point, and maybe uh, Sanjeev can uh, enlighten us. He talks about a very special relationship between pendural moon and Rajkumari Amrit Kaur and leaves it as a cryptic, cryptically hanging in the balance. That's something I've never come across ever before. And I'd love that if you could elaborate on this salacious detail of Indian history. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, Yes, you can respond for five yeah, minutes sure, uh, sure. to uh, in your well, First of all, this you see, uh, Mr. Moon and uh, Rajkumari got very close to each other when he was the DC of Amritsar, mm -hmm. and he was one of the few people who was therefore asked to resign from the ICS. He was as just, a result, yes, as a result of that, he was asked to resign because it was too much. So of there's a, a lovely story there. Yeah, I was too right. much of a scandal on that, and there's a person by the name of Mr. Koshek 
uh, in Punjab. He is a he is a Punjab civilian. So he has written extensively about the subject. Then he went on to become the Prime Minister of Bhawalpur. Then he was made the Chief Commissioner, of, the Deputy Chief Commissioner of of Himachal. That is where he had this fight with Vyas Pramar because access to uh, Pandit Nehru was far greater for him than it was for the for the <laughs> foot soldier <laughs> for the foot soldiers. That's another interesting story. But thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Indiva. Thank you. And thank you for having made the point, Indiva, that this was a story on the maps of India. And therefore, many things which are in your domain. <laughs> <laughs> so, but thank you for reading the book very meticulous. I, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, I can't respond to all the questions, but from, you see, I was in Bengal at the time of the GNLF agitation. I was an SDM in Kalimpong. And so I've seen that agitation. And I worked in the Uttarakhand government when Uttarakhand government was made. And I've seen what was happening in Punjab when I was growing up as a student there. Therefore, I'll, I'll just try to, you know, understand these narratives. See, the fact is that there is a very strong sense of ethnicity and linguistic pride which people have. Once this pride is accepted and once this pride, once this is accepted, then a lot of things get sorted out. So these become the these become the necessary, the essential conditions after which many things get sorted out, right? So it is not that the making of uh, Haryana or the making of Punjab will solve all problems, but at least they remove the uh, they remove the difficulties in the process. Now, issues about Gurkha land, and why I mentioned that point was that Gurkha land is meant to operate within the schedules, right? So those schedules, some or the other, are not very effective because we miscalculate the nature of power. The nature of power is such that no one wants to share it. You see, the PM does not want to share his power, the CM doesn't want to share his power, and likewise the DM doesn't want to share his power. So, um, so you know, this is the nature of power, the nature of power being such that people do not want to share it. But let me come to some of these, some of these points which have been raised, which have been made, because then we'll open it up. So uh, one is for sure that uh, <clears throat> My feeling, and of course, we'll, I'll respond to your questions whenever, whenever, in a subsequent edition. Thank you for pointing out. I'll point these mistakes to Harper. Some of them I found out, but this Governor General thing was new, so I'll, I'll get that sorted out. Uh, mm, I wrote all these points. I'm not trying to avoid you, but uh, the issue is that uh, my own feeling about Uttarakhand is that Uttarakhand has developed much more after coming out of UP. And in fact, all the states which have, which have emerged from larger states, that sense of identity is there and that sense of discrimination disappears. Now, once the sense of discrimination disappears, that does not mean that you will immediately get uh, to, to, to do what you wanted to do, but the disappearance of that sense of disaffection, disaffection, that is very important. And it is through that sense that, you know, a lot of and people communicate in their language. People communicate in their in their main languages. So I think that is very important. And one of the other factors, which is true, that you know, whenever it came to when it came to the British India, when it came to them, we didn't. But the fact is that Odisha and Sindh were reorganized on the recommendation of the Simon Commission. So everything about the Simon Commission was also not bad. I mean, there were certain things the Simon Commission. So the Odisha and Sindh were were basically what the Simon Commission had 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 uh, got to that point. Now you are very right when you said about, you know, what do I mean by we? Uh, what I've actually taken this title from, you know, this title came about because one fine day I had to give a title. So, you know, and so I gave this title. It did a little bit. The point about that, you know, I made this distinction between Bharat and India in the sense that India had administrative units because those administrative units were creation of the Raj and those administrative units were not based on language. Whereas, uh, whereas recreating India on linguistic lines was an article of faith with the Indian National Congress. And when I say the Indian National Congress, I mean the larger movement of the Indian, the, that Indian National Congress which had, which had Madan Mohan Malvi also, which had Acharya Narendra Dev also, which also had M.N. Roy for a very brief period. So that was a very different, uh, uh, that was a very different conception. It was actually a movement in which a lot of people uh, were part of. So that is why but when I use the word we, but I, I need to give more thought to it. But I have used the word we in a very, in a very general sense. So in the sense that you see, the, the fact is that uh, starting from as he, the point which Swapan made that in the initial years, there was a lot of resistance uh, to, to the breakup of states. 
But over a period of time, that resistance is gone. And today, it is going to be more on the basis of memoranda, more on the basis of certain documentation. And that is why perhaps uh, there is need to have a permanent uh, reorganization commission which could, you know, sort of keep looking at these issues as they come up. Uh, but the, the uh, point which I am very clear about is that we have to rework the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule because many more powers have to be transferred. In fact, the, the problem that we have in Manipur today is the distrust that is, exists between the, uh, between the Kukis and the Nagas and the, and the Metis. It's, a, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, I mean, you see the videos from both sides. I mean, you, have a, you have a Methi version of the story and you have a Kuki version of the story. So it's, a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something, again, that we need to recognize. And my submission is that it is possible to find interesting solutions. It is possible to find interesting solutions. <laughs> Again, while the, while the and, and you made that Shiv Prasad uh, Gupta, who founded the Kashi Vidya PT, also was the person who was instrumental in the Bharat Mata Mandir. Now, at that point of time, the Bharat Mata Mandir uh, was perhaps required in that shape. I mean, so the, it has to keep evolving. So I, I, I have not the, given. The iconography itself it, is evolving. It is evolved. So I, I have not studied that, uh, though Shiv Prasad Gupta, now I am beginning to read his works in Hindi. Uh, very interesting works he has in Hindi. Uh, including the fact that, you know, he had heard, uh, I mean, his, his visit to Harvard is a very interesting story, but that's for another discussion and another occasion. But thank you very much, Sopan and Indivar. I have noted your points, and uh, hopefully they should find the space in the, in the next edition. And thank you for calling me a scholar, bureaucrat, administrator. I'm, I'm proud to be both. <laughs> thank you. Though one of the, though I must say that, uh, uh, I know you didn't mean it, but in a lighter vein, somebody said it also means that you're neither a scholar nor a bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we are now open uh, for questions and comments. Yes, please. Please use the mic. Say it out to the Sanjeev Vijay scholar as well as a good bureaucrat. Thank you. And, and much better friend also. <laughs> And Sam is batchmate, so I have every reason to say so. In fact, in Orissa, West Bengal, uh, Orissa division, they are saying that Bengalis never wanted Oriya to get a separate state. In fact, Bengalis always say that Oriya is a bhasa no hai. And therefore, Oriyas united themselves to get a state. And they petitioned before Simon Commission to get a different state. I think this all thing is getting highlighted. I must compliment you for a great book. I will go through it before asking any question. But I'm one of the, those who believe that if you don't respect and understand geography, your history can become history. In fact, it's already becoming mystery, but if you want to understand history, <laughs> we must understand the geography. And India, I think one more thing we should appreciate that sub-regional loyalties, we call them as if they are sedition. If we learn to handle those things carefully artif uh, and artfully, we can have, have much more better peaceful India than calling all of them as if because we have seen that language can't keep you together. Hindi could not keep with UP and Bihar. Even Telugu could not keep with uh, the, both the states of uh, Telugu. Same thing is happening even in Orissa also. Sambalpur is, Sambalpuri hate Katakis more than they hate Pakistanis. Yeah. It is nothing <laughs> new. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we must understand the, the nuances of geography, and I, I must say that. A batchmate of mine has done wonderful work, and he deserves all the compliments. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, other we through it and the discourse by all three of you was really enlightening. Thank you. Indeed, said, and I think it's an important point uh, which I disagree with, uh, which is he said there's a tendency to overplay the administrative facet of documenting a country or a region, whatever, and this overemphasis on administration in terms of how we view in contemporary India is probably uh, is slightly problematic. Uh, am I right? In, uh, no, no. I was saying that there is a, uh, there's no question of overemphasis. I, I'm saying that the emphasis is different. In colonial times, the emphasis was on studying colonial administration. Um, and after independence, when we study colonial times, we study oppositional movements. Uh, now we tend to as this book uh, does very well, the emphasis is on administrative arrangements. So, you know, it's a question of what is the major focus of, of work. It's not, in academic life, you know, to say overemphasis is 
all work is welcome. So I wouldn't I, say okay. I'm, I'm not yes. talking about just a small point is that, you know, I recall during the Afghan crisis, which happened from about 1980s onward, uh, there, were, there was a complete first uh, disinterest in India. Secondly, uh, the recurrent question, what has it got to do with us? How, why are we getting involved even in a peripheral or tangential sort of way? Uh, the, in, well, what had happened is that, that right from about the 60s, the entire history of what used to preoccupy when we were students, the Afghan policy of various viceroys, etc., Lord Lytton, etc., was, was neglected and thrown into the dustbin. So these days, nobody actually looks at the Afghan policy. With the result of entire body of knowledge was relegated into the background and cast aside as a colonial relic when actually it has a certain modern application. So I, I would be slightly circumspect in ever dismissing any form of knowledge, whether it emerged as a result of the East India Company's things or subsequently. Uh, or, or even de-emphasizing it too much. Yeah, see, this, uh, I'm being misunderstood, I think, because I would never dismiss anybody of knowledge. No, no, you, you, this, this is too strong of So, you know, there would be, uh, that would not, but on the other the, point. You're not a dismissive type. <laughs> no, no. So, the other, the other thing which you mentioned, uh, that of course the Bengal, uh, Punjab contrast case is very clear. Um, though on the violence thing, I would disagree. Because, you know, if it comes to bloodshed figures, then Punjab leads by a big margin. On the, on the partition violence. Uh, the Bengal story is on a different no, clock. Other, other uh, but is, but the, the, the crucial thing, if I can just finish, mm -hmm. is of course that there is a transfer of populations in Punjab. Yes. So there is land, the result is that since um, there is land on which to resettle people who come in from the other side. And the while the Punjabi narrative is of how they have thrived on the basis of their energy and enterprise, it ignores the fact that actually they were given assets, which was not given in, uh, which was not the case in Bengal. That is. Well, there's uh, another aspect to this. That is the class composition of the people who were coming from Punjab and who were coming from Bengal. In Bengal, it was basically the Namasudras who did not have much. The, the volumes. The volumes were more, and they did not have too much. But in Punjab, the people who came were either the either the Khatris or the Jatsiks. Now, the Khatris were well-educated. They were advocates, barristers, lawyers. So for them to get established was much easier. And the Jats got the land. And that happened because of, as you pointed out, ethnic cleansing that happened on both sides of the border. Kaputla was 80% Muslim. Mm -hmm. Kaputla was an 80% Muslim population state. Patiala was about 65% Muslim. They were, Muslims were less than, you know, you could count them on the fingertips after 1947 and all the lands were changed. So there was a major aspect to that. So at, at this, this idea also came to B.C. Roy when he visited the Amritsar session of the Indian National Congress. There are two or three other points which I wanted to share with you before we close. One was the Lakshadweep as a union territory. Lakshadweep became a union territory because when it became very clear to the MHA that Kerala is going to turn communist when it became very clear to the MHA that Kerala is going to turn communist, they did not want Lakshadweep to be part of the, of the, of the, of the, of, 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 of Kerala, because they were a bit skeptical about what would happen there. So that is one aspect of, uh, of something which has never, never, never been discussed. Lakshadweep did not have elections till 1960s, because even the first uh, MP was a nominated MP. So Lakshadweep was the last of the territories in India to be fully, firmly, finally integrated. Today, of course, it's got the second largest HDA, but the comparisons are not very, uh, because it's a very small place. But these are these are very interesting. So the bureaucracy has to be recognized to the fact that this was never brought out in the, in the political domain. Because had this come out in the political domain, we would have had arguments and counter arguments, this or that. But this was done very quietly. But I think it was a very significant move for to which some anonymous joint secretary in the MHA ought to be given credit for. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we can now take up some questions. Yes, Dr. Sanjeev Gautam, you had a question? Yes, I'm Dr. Sanjeev Gautam from manuscript section. I have seen you uh, working in manuscript section. 
I first uh, congratulate you for such a nice book. And uh, I think uh, your topic seems to be from uh, the preamble of our Constitution. Uh, it looks uh, like uh, the same line you have uh, applied on uh, your book. But I have uh, uh, one uh, interesting question for you. Have you ever studied uh, uh, this uh, uh, integration of uh, the princely states, uh, how it was different from the uh, princely states and the other provinces? And the second thing, how the uh, 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 Punjab Hill states, have you ever studied the Punjab Hill states? Because I belong to that particular area. So I would like to have uh, uh, your uh, no, uh, particular opinion on that particular uh, state. Thank Please. you. Go ahead. See, the Punjab Hill states were always, the Britishers had, uh, they, they had uh, agencies, they had residents and they had agencies to manage the different formation. So there were two agencies. One was the agency for the Punjab states and the Punjab Hill states were always very different. So the Punjab Hill states were never really, because Punjab Hill states are mostly Hindu kingdoms, mostly Hindu kingdoms believing in the Devi worship, cult worship and things. Punjab states are basically Jat Sikh states, uh, primarily Sikh states. And there have been a lot of conflicts between the Punjab states and the Punjab hill states, largely because Guru Gobind Singh had, uh, had a very, uh, I did not have a very pleasant experience with the Punjab hill states. So they have always been managed differently. Always from the very beginning they have been managed differently. So that's from where Himachal came into being. That's from where Himachal came into being. So it's a, uh, and, and you know, the point is that uh, the Punjab, the, the, right from the beginning of the setting up of Himachal, they never wanted to be part of Punjab. In fact, the Maha Punjab movement was something which the RSS wanted, was something which the Punjabi Hindus wanted. Uh, some hill states uh, were carved out, uh, means uh, they were part of Punjab. And you must have seen no. the gazetteer of Punjab hill states. Uh, it shows the story of the, uh, I, I uh, the small states of Punjab. And one of those states was Kullu also, Kullu no, and, Kullu was and the Bushehr state, because mm -hmm. I have worked on the Bushehr state. So oh. I'm talking about that one, right. please. Thank you. That's an area that I'm not really, uh, I'm not really competent to, to talk about that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, one point that comes to my mind is, this is more of an observation. The Constitution of India, though it is a union of states, India is a union of states, though the structure is federal. And the purpose obviously was to give it a strong center, especially in the aftermath of partition. And that was, of course, a brilliant move on the part of the Constituent Assembly. And it is that which gave the freedom to the Union to change the boundaries of the states. In fact, the Constitution of India gives so much power to the Union in this, that even the consultation with the State Assembly is not mandatory. The state assembly, of course, may completely reject the idea of changing its boundaries, but the union government can still do that. I'm not aware of any large federation anywhere in the world which gives that kind of flexibility to the union government or the federal government for such a drastic reorganization of states. So what was put there in the constitution as something which would give India a strong center has also, on the flip side, given the, our system the flexibility to keep changing the boundaries as per the political demands, the pressures, ethnic identities, linguistic movements, etc., etc. And probably that is the reason, as you have rightly said, so many maps of India have come up after 1947 I don't think that any other large country yes, in the world right. no, would have no, no, gone no. through so many uh, cartographic changes and so many uh, changes in terms of their ad administrative reorganization as has happened in the case of India. Yes, and, 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 and why not? I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't make a difference. In fact, I would also suggest that if we could have a little something for six scheduled areas, I mean, that gives people a lot of… Uh, you see, th th these are also like, like the titles, like the… 
exalted highness, his highness. I mean, what was the Nazam of Hyderabad being done? And the Nazam of Hyderabad was called his exalted highness, right? So as he pointed out, I mean, you know, you create all these things. If you make some people happy, if you create, I mean, within Manipur, if you create a kooky area, you know, a kooky tribal council, a miso tri I mean, I mean, these are all things that we can imagine that we have to think about more creatively because one of the issues about both Gorkha land, Bodo land, the area that, are, that they are not even in a majority in the districts that they claim for themselves. So one reason why Gorkha land cannot be made is not because of the area, because area wise Sikkim is nothing. But the point is that when they, you, you want Siliguri and all these areas, the Bengalis outnumber the Gorkhas. So you can't really start. So it's when you look at things in a, in a much larger perspective, you realize that uh, and that's happened because of large-scale changes. I mean, Koch Bihar, Bodos, for example, were a majority. Uh, but by 1947-48, uh, the Bodos could have got their Bodo land if they'd wanted it. But now it's not possible <laughs> because now everything has changed. Yes. You see, because now after, uh, you see, especially on the borders, Koch Bihar, which was a, which was a Bodo Koch area, is now 80% Bengali. So how do you, how do you create a Bodo land over there? So these are all the things which are which are very very significant. You cannot uh, Manipur. I mean, it's a problem. It's it's such an intense problem that it cannot be resolved. I mean, I mean, there's no easy solution to it. There are all further problems that are going to Uttarakhand, for example. I can imagine because the the way demographic is changing there and the way people are moving from the hills to the plains, very soon there's going to be a issue unless we can resolve it differently. Punjab, once the next census is held. The number of Sikhs who have moved out and the number of migrants who have moved in, we are going to have an issue on our hands. So that's where uh, electronic voting for migrants in this country, all these are questions which, are, which, which ought to be discussed, which we have to discuss. And I think the great thing about our country is that we are willing to discuss anything other than the territory, uh, territorial integrity of the country, which I think is also very important because we can't open this question. Some things have to be kept sacrosanct. Right? Thank you. I think we don't have any other questions, sir. Would you like to comment at the end? Or anything, if otherwise we can. Well, no, I mean, I, mean, I think one of the real lessons of Sanjeev's book is that the amount of uh, possibilities it throws open for subsequent research. And, uh, you know, so sometimes research on post-1947 India suffers because of the patchiness of the archival material which is available in, in our, at our disposal. But even that can be overcome. But each of these, you know, just the creation of Gujarat and Mumbai, I mean, Gujarat and Maharashtra, the internal strains within these movements, etc., each of them deserve a far more reflective, thorough political study. And I hope that some sometime some of the people who come and use the library here, other resources here, will be able to do justice to, the, to them. Thank you very much. So with this, we come to the end of the program. I take this opportunity to thank all those who are present this afternoon. And I extend again, you know, my sincere thanks to Dr. Sanjeev Chopla, Professor Indivar Kamtekar, and of course, Dr. Sapandas Gupta for graciously accepting uh, our invitation and being present. It has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you. We, of course, have tea outside waiting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.